My name is Robert Hunt, and I am happy and proud to introduce to you the incredibly talented Philip Guru. Philip was my intern in 2007, and uh, he's still a fifth-year graduate student in Stanford, and today he will present some of his promising research. Hey. Great. Thanks, Robert. Uh, can everyone hear me okay here? Okay, cool. Let me know if you need me to adjust the volume or anything later. All right, so my name is Philip, and I'm a PhD student at Stanford. And today I'm going to talk about my research, which is also an open source tool, and it's called CDE. And CDE allows you to automatically create portable software packages uh, for, on Linux. And uh, this talk will be in two parts. So the first half, I'm going to go through the slides talking about the system and how it works. And the second half, I'm going to attempt to do a live demo and hope it works. Okay, so before I start, I want to make two really quick acknowledgments. So First, I'd like to thank Robert for inviting me here today. And um, Robert was this, a great boss when I was here in 2007. He, he gave me this really good mix of freedom and supervision. So on one hand, he allowed me a lot of freedom in hacking and you know, making my own mistakes and um, hacking on the systems. But on the other hand, he was always very available like, you know, to chat and to work on stuff. And also, especially after I, um, even after I left Google, after my internship was over, he was very responsive on emails when I you know, would talk to him about research and stuff. So thanks again, Robert. Um, the second person I'd like to acknowledge is my PhD advisor at Stanford, Dawson. So Dawson has been very supportive of my research um, ideas over these past few years, and he's very good at asking probing tough questions to really get at the corner cases and to break systems. So it really helped me to build more robust tools. So with that, I'd like to just introduce the problem uh, domain and try to convince you of why it's a pervasive and a very important problem. So the problem has three parts. So the first part is it's hard to package up your software so that other people can reliably run it. So anyone who's ever hacked on code in any setting knows that if you want someone else to run your code, it's non-trivial, right? Because you have to actually package it up in some way so that when you give it to somebody else, they can run your software. So uh, a, a fundamental reason why this is a problem is that you can only test on your own machine, right? Like you can't really predict all the kind of quirks and different OS versions and libraries and what's on other people's machines. Um, so any kind of make files or build scripts or installation instructions you write will be inherently overfit for your own machine. And the graphic I have at the bottom of the slide here shows that um, there's this recent study of labor statistics that showed that by now there are about 13 million people um, who do programming at work beyond just creating spreadsheet macros or database queries. So 13 million people who are writing code, but amongst those only 3 million are professional software engineers. So professional software engineers have this great tool chain and development process for pushing and deploying their software and queuing and everything. But for the rest of the people who are writing software, for these 10 million people, who are they? Right? They're, they're research scientists in all fields. Right? I mean, scientists spanning so many fields are running their experiments computationally. And they want to be able to share their experiments, have other people run them, uh, and build off of their experiments. These are um, designers doing prototypes. These are engineers doing kind of hacking. Um, they're consultants also. Um, and also, this 10 million doesn't even count all the countless people who are doing open source hacking, right, or hobbyists and students. So it affects a lot of people, this, this software packaging problem. But the second half of this problem affects even more people, right? So it can be hard to install and run other people's software, right? So there are an order of magnitude more people who run software than who produce it. And for them, you know, installation is non-trivial, right? So this is even on uh, Google Chrome, on this you know, very well-polished uh, piece of commercial software, there's still like thousands of discussion forum issues of people just having troubles installing it because they're o most likely because their OS variant has some libraries or have some they have something on there that um, the installers didn't take care of. Um, but this is even with you know well you know packaged uh, professional software this happens. But you know if someone is hacking on code and wants to share it, you know one of the biggest problems with installing software is what people know and you know, affectionately known as dependency hell, right? So on kind of all operating systems on Windows, Mac, on Linux, what happens is software assumes you have certain libraries on your computer. So and if those libraries don't exist, you have to chase them down. You may use a package manager, you may have to compile them, you may have to chase down libraries, and those libraries depend on other libraries that you have to transitively chase down. And eventually you get to a point where one library conflicts with um, there's a library that one program needs, and the library that version that your new software needs conflicts with that one. So you really can't have it both ways. Um, and another reason why it's hard to install software is some people just don't have permission to install software. So if you're on a lot of uh, corporate enterprise systems, the IT department administers your machine, so you don't have root permission on your own machine. Or if you're a university researcher and you want to um, run your jobs on a compute cluster that's administered by the university, you don't have root permission. So it's really hard for you to install software on that, that you can run your experiments. Lastly, 
on a related note, some people don't even want to take the risk of installing software. So it's like, because installation requires root access, it requires mucking around with your system internals. You know, some people don't even want to bother with that because you have a production server that's running all these, you know, system critical processes. And I'm like, oh, I want you to try out my software on your system. You know, most people aren't going to be willing to, you know, do sudo install and, and risk breaking something that already um, is working. So these problems for, of software distribution and software installation affect all operating systems, but they're especially gross on Linux-based systems. Right? So, so Linux has all these different distributions, each with their own package managers and conventions and idioms and ways of doing things. And this, this is great for freedom and openness, but it actually leads to a lot of fragmentation. So there's not a unified, easy way to um, automatically package your software and have people run it reliably. So I'm going to talk about how people currently distribute software. Right? So there's two axes here in this, this graph. The horizontal is the amount of pain you, as a developer, must suffer when you're packaging software. And the vertical axis is the amount of pain your users must suffer. So here's how people currently do it. Right? So on one extreme, you just zip up everything and just throw it over the fence. Right? So this, this is no pain for you. You just zip up your code or scripts or data files or whatever and just upload it or email it to your, to your colleagues. Now, this is potentially a lot of pain for the users because they have to have the right versions of the programs and plugins and extensions and libraries installed before they can even run your code. Now, this might seem like a straw man example, but actually this is what happens in um, the scientific um, and research world all the time. Right? So like scientists are hacking on some scripts to do climate analysis or something, and you have a bunch of data files, you have a bunch of Python scripts mixed with some CSL plus code, and your colleague's like, oh, I want to build off of the experiment. Can I get your code? I loved your paper. Can I get your code? You're like, sure. You zip up your code and give it to them. And the chances of them actually being able to run it out of the box are pretty low. So what else can you do? So the next more user-friendly thing is you'd make a source distribution. All right, so you uh, package the source code, write some make files, write some configure scripts, documentation. It's a bit more pain for you, but the user should be able to do configure and make, and hopefully things work. But of course, compilation is non-trivial because they need to have the right compiler tool chain, the right libraries, the right everything in order to actually compile your software. So what else can you do? You can integrate with the package management system of your favorite distribution, um, whether that's Debian or Red Hat or so on. And this requires a bit more work on your part because you have to kind of try to structure your software and dependencies around what is already in the package management ecosystem. But if you do it properly, um, your users can technically just have to do sudo app get install. Um, and they'll be able to get your stuff. And this works pretty well. Um, of course, they need to require root access to do this. But it works decently well until one version of one library is not in the package manager. And as soon as that, you, know, you break that beautiful world of package management, you're back to the source distribution. So what else can you do? You can recreate, you know, this is more pain for you, you can recreate your entire environment within a virtual machine. Right? You can just be like, here's my computer, I'm going to start a fresh VM image, reinstall everything I had on my computer, and my programs, and my scripts, and everything, test it to make sure it works, and then just ship the entire several gigabyte VM image to my colleagues. And that's pretty easy for the user. They should be able to run it on any host OS, actually, and run your experiment, or run your scripts, or program, and so on. So it's pretty easy to use, but the problem is that you know, I don't put this very low at the, at the lowest on the, um, on the y-axis because they're still not running it natively on the machine. They have, this, you know, they, have their host, they have their host operating system with all their you know, things that they like, their tool chain, and then they, they're running something else. You know, they have to communicate maybe through a local network or through shared drives or something, and it still doesn't feel natural. So the easiest thing for users to do is for you to create a robust one-click installer. Right, so this is the most pain for you, but the easiest for users. So they should just double click, install the software. This is how commercial off the shelf software should work. Right? It should be really easy for the user. Of course, even then you have these forms of you know, people having trouble installing software. But and this is a lot of work for the developer, of course, right? because you have to um, go through the whole process of testing and making sure your installer is robust. And you know, companies that create software spend lots of effort and time on QAing their installers. So, this is the, the lay of the landscape now, right? So there's this inherent trade-off between pain that developers must suffer and pain that the users must suffer. So my bold claim during this talk is that um, the tool that I've been working on, CDE, actually falls right here, conveniently on this graph, that it, in that it minimizes the pain for the developer and also minimizes the pain for the end user. I'm going to spend the rest of the talk trying to convince you of um, how, that, you know, how we accomplish this. 
So CD stands for Automatic Packaging of Code, Data, and Environment. So by that, I mean we package up the binary executable code, all the data files and other auxiliary files you need, and the environment, which is like environment variables, a dynamic linker, and other kinds of auxiliary libraries you need. So I'm about to show you the entire CDE user's manual. This is all you need to know to use it. Three steps. Number one, um, it's a Linux tool. So you create a package on your Linux computer. And to create a package, all you do is you prepend any set of commands that you want to package with CDE, with executable itself. And CDE runs those commands and automatically packages up all those dependencies. And it does so by monitoring all the files it's accessing while it's, um, while it's running and just throwing them all in this self-contained package. Number two is you just transfer the package. A package is just a directory of files. You can, you can move it um, however you like to another Linux machine uh, in whatever way you like. And number three is once it gets to the target machine, you can execute the software from within the package on any modern Linux computer. And by modern Linux computer, I'll show you some experimental results later. Basically, anything with the, with the kernel that's around, you know, you have about a five-year time window. So uh, packages you create now can run on Linux machines as old as around 2006 or so. But it has to be Linux only and has to be x86 because uh, I'm not doing any kind of emulation, uh, hardware emulation. So to run the commands within the package, you prepend those exact same commands after you've unzipped the package with CDE-exec. And CDE-exec is a kind of a wrapper program that will, ex that will kind of recreate the environment on the target machine and execute your software on there. And it runs it natively without any installation, which means it's actually running you know, binary code on the machine. There's no VM layer or emulator layer or anything else. It's just as though it's any other binary on the machine. So three steps to use CD, right? So there's a CD executable, create the package, transfer the package, and then execute the package to CD exec. So I'm going to spend the next part of the talk uh, t diving into the internals of how it works. So on a very high level, how CDE works is that it uses the Linux ptrace um, system call to attach onto a monitor process to monitor all the um, file system calls it's making. So ptrace is a way uh, for processes on Linux to, to monitor or to spy on one another. So a debugger like GDB or a system call monitoring tool like strace will use this mechanism. So what CD is interested in is it's interested in looking at all the ways the process accesses the file system, like changing directories or, more importantly, opening files. So um, when it monitors the action, here's what happens on a timeline right here. So I'm going to look here. So you know, the time goes this way. And I'm on the mic, so <laughs> won't jump. Um, so the program first, let's say it issues an open system call, right? So it opens some file, and there's a string in here that says what the path is. The kernel takes control, uses the file system to open the file, but then before the kernel has a chance to return to the program, CD actually takes control of uh, the control, um, takes control of execution, and uh, sees what file has actually been opened and just copies that file into a packet, just straight up copies it. Um, and the packet is just some subdirectory in your current directory. After it's done, it returns control to the kernel, which returns control back to the program. So CD just is kind of uh, copying pack, uh, files in the package while it's running. And on the other end, once you transfer your uh, package to the other machine, to execute it, you run it with CD exec. And CD exec uses the exact same ptrace mechanism to attach onto the monitored process. But instead of simply spying on the process, it actually um, reroutes or detours the system calls. So whenever the process wants to access a file, CD exec will actually rewrite that system call to, so that it accesses actually the file inside of the package itself. So here's how it works on a timeline. The program issues an open system call with some file path, right? Like lib libc, for example. The kernel takes control, but then CD exec takes control right away, and then it rewrites the, it rewrites the argument of the open system call. So it actually rewrites that string to point to a string inside the package itself. And now, after the string's been rewritten, it returns control to the kernel, which opens the file from within the package. The file is actually, you know, the kernel is just blindly following whatever that string says. So because it's been rewritten, it actually will open the file from within the package and return the file descriptor back to the user program. So the, the monitor program doesn't know that the kernel has actually been tricked into opening a different file. But, you know, it, it kind of works all behind the scenes. So with that, it, CD exec is able to kind of create this kind of sandbox, if you will, that allows... Um, programs to only access things within their within the package. Okay, so this 
table contains a lot of details that go through one row at a time. So basically, these are the details of what system calls CD um, actually intercepts. So um, it only has to intercept 34 out of the 340 or so, about 10% of the system calls on Linux. Um, these are mostly ones dealing with the file system. So it actually doesn't have to intercept that much. Um, so I'm going to go through each category at a time. The most common category of system calls that uh, CD intercepts are ones that access file paths. So open is the canonical example of this. It takes some path specifying a file name, and then it, um, it opens the file. So what CDE will do, which I just showed in the previous slide, is it just copies that file in the packet. It's very straightforward. And what CDE exec will do is that it will reroute the system call to open the version inside the package. Um, so the next one, mutating the file system. So if you're creating symlinks or renaming files, CDE will actually repeat that same action in the package to kind of keep it in sync. So if you're renaming a file in the file system, CDE will rename the version in the package just so that they're in sync with one another. And CDE exec, again, will just redirect the path so that if you try to rename a file, actually rename the file inside your package rather than the one natively on the machine. And it's important that CDE exec always is redirecting inside the package because you can probably, you're probably going to be moving files, uh, moving things, to, programs to machines where those files do not exist on the native file system. And if they do exist, they may be the wrong versions. So you have to use the thing in the package. It has to be totally self-contained. Uh, the next type, yes, question. Sure. Great, that's a great question. I'll repeat the question here. Um, so the question is, you know, how do I distinguish between files that inherently belong on one machine, like Etsy, like the conf files, um, or files that you can share, like libraries? Um, that's a really good question. Um, I don't go over it in these slides, but I actually have a, a, a configuration file you can specify with files to ignore, and I've just preceded those with, like, there's about a dozen or so files in the ignore list, and um, about a dozen covers. One of them is like Etsy hosts, for example, because like, if you move the host file, it doesn't, networking doesn't work on another machine. This is a great question. So, so the answer to that is that there is kind of this can list of a dozen or so files that just from empirical experiences we've built up. Um, and the user can add to that. Um, but with that can list, things work out of the box pretty much all the time. Does that make sense? OK, cool. Um, so to get the current, uh, if, if the program requests to get the current directory, uh, CDE will actually update its record of the current directory, of the, the monitor process of the current directory. And, and the reason it needs to do that is because uh, uh, system calls might access files through relative paths. And you need to join a relative path with the current directory in order to get the real path. So it's just bookkeeping. And CDE exec will actually spoof the current directory. It will actually you know, return a fake current directory that, that that fools the program into thinking that's still on the original machine. So there are some programs that are really sensitive to hard-coded current directories. And um, if you don't actually spoof the current directory, things will just break. So when you change directories, it's a pretty straightforward bookkeeping as well. I mean, if the, if the program changes directory, uh, CD needs to keep track of you know, what the current directory is for resolving paths again. Um, when programs spawn children, so when they spawn subprocesses or subthreads, um, both CD and CD exec actually attach onto them so that, you're, uh, so that it's able to track entire process trees. So if you have a program that launches a bunch of other programs, it'll, you'll snatch them all, um, which is really, really important. And lastly, when you're uh, executing, when there's a system called to execute a program, CD will actually not only copy the binary, the executable, into the package, it will copy the dynamic linker as well. So uh, a dynamic linker is a, a, a utility on Linux that's, um, that's used to start up, to help start up a lot of types of binaries on Linux. And you kind of need, the, the binaries and dynamic linker need to have a compatible version. So we actually copy both of them into the package. And on the CD exec end, once you're executing, um, it actually runs the dynamic linker from within the package on the executable rather than running the system's own dynamic linker, again, because they may be incompatible. So this is, allows us to actually get farther in portability. So this is what, what allows us to get about a five-year bound on, around a five-year bound on the kernel portability. Because without this dynamic linker trick, you may only get you know, a few years at most. Cool. So um, I'm going to go through a, a, a quick run example um, and then I'll, I'll summarize the results and move into the demo. So uh, in this example, let's say I'm, I'm compiling source code. Right? I have some home PG my project directory. This contains a bunch of C, C++ code, and I just want to type make, and that should compile all my code. 
right? So, but what I want to do is, let's say I want to package up the entire compiler tool chain involved in my entire compilation process so that I can move that package to, let's say, a cluster. Let's say this compilation takes forever and it can be distributed or something. I want, want to just throw that entire compilation job on a supercomputer or a cluster so that I can compile. Or my friend might want to edit and compile my code, but not want to have to install all the same compilers and headers and everything on, on his machine. So to do that, we can just use CD. I can just, because I type make to make my whole project, in order to create a package of CD, all I do is just type CDE make. Right? And what that does is CDE launches make and attaches onto it with, uh, with ptrace. Make will start accessing files. So it accesses first its own binary, and then it accesses the make file to, to see what commands it should make. Um, and CD is monitoring both of those and copying them in the package. So then make spawns a subprocess, GCC, to do the compilation. CD attaches onto the child. GCC uh, finds itself. It loads some C code. It loads some H files. So this is a pretty standard compilation job, right? It's, um, loading C and H files. Interestingly, not only is GCC loading uh, source files from the project directory, it's also loading, it also sometimes has to load uh, header files that are system wide, right? Like here, there's like user includes Linux. So anyone who's ever tried to you know, get someone's source code and compile it on a different Linux distribution knows that header files are often incompatible across distributions. Like you may have the same name of header and you try to compile and it says, oh, this header doesn't have this field or it has some weird error. But with CDE, we actually package up the exact header that you need to do the compilation. So there is no conflict, no matter what machine you move it to. So GCC might spawn the assembler, for example, and that loads some more files and you know, so on. And CD attaches on all of them. And while the program is running, um, CD will uh, copy all of those files as they're being accessed into the package. And the package is literally a subdirectory called cde-package in our current directory. And inside the CD package, there is a pseudo root directory called cde root. They're just regular subdirectories, nothing magical. And notice how all the files are just straight up copied into the CD root, preserving their original paths. So we preserve all the paths, and if there's sim links or other kinds of things, we preserve all those. You basically just want a slice of the file system that your program has accessed and just moving it all in the package. Question? Mm -hmm. Yes, so the question is that, um, are we copying temporary files? Yeah, so I'm copying the temporary files into there, and I believe that what happens is when you, um, when you do a remove file system call, when the, uh, when the does system calls the delete files, I actually delete the temporary files in the package as well. So the package should be pretty clean. But at worst, and the general point that Rob Rowan brings up is, you know, there might be extraneous files in the package, and um, sometimes that's the case. But um, at least, you know, I want at least all the files you need, and maybe there's some extras. Cool. Um, so now it's, the package is self-contained. It's just a directory. So you can tar it up, gzip it, and move it to another computer. So let's say I started with an Ubuntu laptop, and I want to move it to a Fedora server. Just move the, move the package to another computer. It has to be the same architecture, of course, because we're just running binaries. And once we're on the other computer, um, what I can do is I can execute the package now with CD exec. I can execute the entire compilation job. Um, on that other computer. Now note that this other computer does not have make on it. It does not have GCC. It doesn't have any kernel headers. It doesn't have anything on it. It could be just like a bare bones computer, which is often what happens with like these compute clusters. It's just a bare Linux install. So in order to execute it, I have to first change into the project directory, which is kind of this long path, right? So you have to go inside the package, go inside the root, and go inside the project directory inside the package, because that's where all my source files and all my, um, all my make files, more importantly. And inside, um, Normally, if I'm in that directory, I just type make, right? But make doesn't exist on this machine, or it might have a different version. So in order to reproduce that compilation job, I type cd-exec make. So I'm typing the original make command, prepending it with cd-exec. And when, it, when that happens, cd-exec launches make and attaches onto it with ptrace again to monitor its actions. When make tries to access files, like user bin make, for example, it tries to access its own binary, cd-exec will reroute that system call so that it actually points to the file inside the package. It just does a simple string, um, string rewrite. It does a kind of a path munging thing. And when make a, um, launches children, CD exec attaches onto them as well. And again, just reroutes every system call it's making related to files into the package. So the, the high bit here is that all the red arrows go inside the package. Right? So it's really like CD exec is creating a sandbox so that all the um, files that you're accessing are inside the package itself. 
Um, but there's not there's not a there's not a virtualization or an emulation layer at all, right? These make GCC and AS, they're all just executing straight up binary code on x86 Linux. There's no, yeah, you know, there's no magic going on. So they're all executing at nearly native speed. Um, the only time to slow down is when you're making these system calls, they have to do a little bit of overhead context switching and munging around the strings. So um, I'm going to summarize our experimental results here um, before moving to the demo. So uh, the the binary for CD has been downloaded around 1,700 times since uh, it was released in November. So, and this is obviously tiny for things that are done at production scale at Google here, but for a you know for a universal research project with one developer, I think this is a it's a decent number, and it's it's a good enough number for me to have gotten user feedback, bug reports, feature requests, and um, and also just real world use cases too. So it's been actually really helpful for my research, um, and people have actually found it useful in all sorts of domains, which I will talk about later. After the demo, so the, the high bit of the of the experiments is that you know 16 CD packages we took mostly from our users um, can execute on popular x86 Linux distributions from the past five years with no installation or configuration. So all we did was we you know we asked some of the users, oh can you just give us your packages? They're like, okay. So you know it started on their computer, and you know their computer can be any x86 Linux distro from the past five years, all sorts of distros, and we just um, we just threw them on the six of these popular distros. And the, the x-axis shows the kernel comp compilation dates. So their kernels go from 2006 all the way to the end of 2010. And they just ran out of the box. We just threw them on the computer, no installation, CD exec ran their things. And these, these programs range from like scientific scripts to, um, to games to 3D applications to like other sorts of researchy things. Um, so all, just all sorts of apps that just run out of the box. So this is a summary of what um, this is basically a summary of what the CD system is what it can do, and I'll take I'll be happy to take some questions at this time, and then I'll move on to the demo. So, questions? Okay, so I couldn't hear I can't hear it too much. <laughs> Shared libraries. Okay, and what other files are you talking about? Uh -huh. So missing system called and shared library. Okay, cool. So I'll try to hopefully answer both parts. So the first part of the question was, do I copy over all the shared libraries? Okay. And the second part was the older systems have missing system calls and so on. Okay. So I'll, I'll take both of them in turn. So the shared library thing, the shared library is just files. So everything is just a file. So all in the package are all the shared libraries, you know, even libc, even down to libc, everything, all shared libraries are a copy in the package. And you, you'll see this in the demo too. And the second part of the question is, um, what happens when you go on an older machine that's so old that the kernel is missing system calls, um, or the system call interface is different? And that's where it, that's where the uh, the thing breaks down. So I, you know, you can't take the package back to like a 1995 Linux kernel just because it, the version is so different. So the the limit is really the ABI layer between the kernel system call interface and the user space. And it turns out that that layer is actually very stable. That you know all sorts of incompatibilities with different distros pretty much all happen at the user space level. It's, it's like people, different distros have different things that they want, different libraries they want. But the kernel, the, from the kernel of the user space, like they try to keep things very stable. So you have about a five year shelf life um, there. But anything older than that, so anything older than a 2006 kernel will face that problem of um, missing system calls. And it'll actually fail fast too, because as soon as it starts up, it'll say the binary is incompatible. We can't run uh, on this kernel. Um, I'll take this question here first. And then. So what will you do with device mode for CSFS file system? That's one of my Okay. Okay. Should I answer one? H1 turn. Okay, I'll go fast. Those special files are actually in the ignored list. So I actually, um, yeah, I don't do proxys um, or device uh, device nodes. So yeah, those kind of pseudo files I don't take. Yeah. Uh, second question. Uh, how do you tie like uh, uh, there are a lot of configuration files that will divulge extra information about the system that the package was created mm -hmm. on, that are completely irrelevant and in some cases not very productive. Right. To, like I may not want to check my shadow password mm -hmm. file copies, or my fan can be configured in a completely different way, which is actually incompatible. And even though you can run the binary because of fan setup and compatibility, it won't actually start. Mm. Um, so, from my understanding, one of the questions about privacy, right, of just exposing information about a system you don't want. Um, 
currently there's no there's no setting for that. So the, currently the thing is, yeah, use it at your own risk. Like you, you can after you create the package, yeah, you know, it's your responsibility to look inside the package and make sure your Etsy password is in there. And if it is, a lot of times, like you're saying, it probably touches you know your shadow password file, but it might not actually use the actual contents of it. So I don't do any more detailed analysis. That would be a good um, thing for future work though of how do you make these kind of safer. But right now there's kind of no privacy guarantees. And you know one thing you can do is you can just you know create a proxy Etsy shadow password when you distribute. Um, so is there other? So yeah, one more quick one, and then I'll. Uh, so have you tried this with multi-hammer and microlips? Not, not just this. Um, I haven't tried it with microlipsy, but it, I don't think that should be any issue because I mean I don't do anything special with libc. It's it's a file I include in the package. I mean, if you can imagine binaries that don't use libc and link something else, you can imagine static binaries too. Yeah, I don't imagine that would be an issue though. All right, so quick question here. Yes. Um, so running CD on itself. Um, so you, the reason why you can't infinitely recurse is that ptrace actually only allows you one layer of um, tracing. So um, that's actually a very good. Um, so Robert brought a great point of you know one of the things that bounds this portability. It's actually not the binding factor, but you know what if the CDE binary itself is not compatible across machines, right? Because it has to start somewhere. The CDE binary runs native on the machine. It doesn't. You can't supervise itself. Um, Practically, how I deal with that is I actually a CD is actually a very simple executable, and it has very small dependencies. It has a very bare libc dependency, and I can trick the compiler into compiling against a really old version of libc, so that it actually this 2006 bound is not because of CD. CD is not the bound of portability. That's a that's a that's a good question there. Um, any other questions at this point? Cool. One more quick one. I'll go into the demo. <laughs> Oh no, right. So there is no um, this this Chirrut kind of jail I created is a it's a fake one. There's I do not use the Chirrut system call mechanism, and the reason why is because first Chirrut requires root access to use, and second um, it doesn't allow you to kind of poke holes in the sandbox, shall I say? So because I have this ignore mechanism that I don't want to go into too much detail, but you know there's a way of selectively um, saying some things should be in the sandbox, some things shouldn't, and with Chirrut you can't have that flexibility. But mo most importantly though is um, the root access involved. We don't want this to be a privileged operation. Cool. All right. So I'm going to dive into the demo, and um, I think hopefully some of the other questions will kind of fall out while um, I'm doing the demo. Okay. So in the demo itself, I should show the slide also. Ah. Okay. So in the demo, what I'm going to do is um, create a package. I'm going to do this, right? I'm going to uh, have I install two virtual machines on this computer on my Mac. Um, one is an Ubuntu from 09, and another is a Nopix live CD, a blank Nopix live CD from 06. I'm going to create packages on the Ubuntu computer and then transport them back in time about three or four years to an old Nopix machine. Um, and I'm going to do two demos. The first one involves Python, involves a scientific computing uh, scripting example. And the second demo involves um, Google Earth, the 3D map application. Cool. So just introduce you to the VMs. This is the Ubuntu, the 2009 Ubuntu, and you can see the U name on here. It's uh, 2009, and my username is just my name. My username is my name here. And the second one is a Nopix. Oh, it's asleep. And the username here is just Nopix. Yeah. So is the font size okay for everybody here? Great. Okay. Demo number one. So let's say I'm a scientist, and I'm writing Python scripts to do scientific data analysis. This is very, very common. So I have some script. It really doesn't matter what it does. I just took this demo from some, some place on the internet. There's some Python script, and it like munges some London data set files. Maybe this is like climate data, for example. So there's just a bunch of data. So uh, typically, you would run it like this, right? So you you run your analysis, and it you know does some number crunching, and it plots some data. And this is you know what scientists do. And there's just some random data I plot it, and then you interact with it, and then hopefully you get some great scientific insights. So, in order for me to have run this program, I need um, I need to have Python installed, but I also need these kind of third-party libraries to do all this graphing. Now, I, I took all this for granted because I've been on my computer for years, and I've always had these installed, or I installed them once upon a time and forgot about it. And it's like my computer's always worked. So now, let's say my colleague wants to run my experiments. They're like, "Oh, I loved your paper on 
one did in climate analysis. I want to rerun your experiments, one, to verify your results, and two, to test my own hypotheses, to build off of your experiments. So this is a very common thing in science that people want to do. So I simulated copying the files over. So great. So I'm like, fine. It's so easy, right? There's like a Python script and a data file. So you know, what more could you want? So this is the throw it over the fence, right? I'll just give you my files. I mean, everybody has Python, right? I mean, everyone has Python in their machine. So what happens? All right, I mean, predictably, something goes wrong, right? This something always goes wrong, because the thing that goes wrong here is that there's no module named NumPy. So NumPy is a third-party numerical analysis and math library for Python that you have to install separately from regular Python. So there's all sorts of way to, ways to install it. Um, depending on your system, it could be installed from a package manager. It could be that easy. Or you may have to chase down the dependencies yourself and install stuff yourself. Again, this is going to lead to dependency hell, right? I and mean, this, is, this is one path to dependency hell. You know, you try to install this, you have to install other stuff, and so on. Actually, NumPy isn't even the only dependency. After this fails, there is um, matplotlib, which is a graphing library, which has a ton of graphical dependencies. So how can CDE help? So knowing CDE, what we can do is we can just simply just run our exact same command, right? This is it. Exact same command, prepend with CDE. CDE is in our home directory, so I got to go here. This will start it up and create that package, right? It'll just monitor all the system calls. It's running my program. Um, it's monitoring all the system calls and copying all the files into a package. So it takes a bit longer to start up because exact this um, program actually has a lot of dependencies. So once it starts up, you can interact with it. It's just a regular program execution. Nothing funny going on. So I can close it. So now it creates the CDE package subdirectory. So what's in here? First thing in the package subdirectory is a CDE exec executable. Remember, this is the executable we're going to use on the other end once we transport it to the Nopix, the old Nopix machine to execute. Um, this is actually the exact same executable CD. I just copied it in here and renamed it. So it's actually pretty simple. Um, CD full environment. Whoa. CD full environment is all the environment variables that were in scope while you're running a program. So we can recreate the same environment variables on the other machine, which is important for things that need like path or home or so on. And then there's some other stuff. The most important thing here is the CDE root, right? So I'm just going to look inside. So this actually looks inside. And notice how CDE root, it mirrors the directories that I had, right? So this is, this is my script right here. I copied it in. It's my data file. This is my Python distribution. It's actually a third-party Python distribution with a bunch of libraries pre-installed. So notice all these SO files are shared libraries. There's some math libraries, for example. Um, these are other Python initialization libraries, fonts, and everything. There's a surprising amount of stuff that goes into just executing a simple Python script, especially when there's graphics involved. Um, all sorts of stuff. Uh, more importantly, there's, there's um, to answer your question from earlier, these are the shared libraries from my system, right? From user lib and from, let's see, user share, just all sorts of, just basically everything, even including libc, right? Just, I just package up everything. So. Now I can just tar up this package, right? Because it's just a bunch of files. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, tar and gzip it and then send it to the other virtual machine. All right, so let's see how big it is. It's 173 megs. So this seems gigantic just for two Python, just for a Python script, but because of those graphics libraries just pull in so much stuff transitively, um, it actually ends up being pretty big. <laughs> I'm going to gzip it. So when I do the copy, I have to actually uh, copy from the virtual machine to my Mac, to the host machine, and I'm going to copy it from the host machine back to the other VM. That's just the easiest way to set up the, the networking on here. So it'll be this kind of two-step process. All right, so how does this zip? It, it zips moderately well. It's like 55 megs, so it's not huge. So I'm going to copy it to um, my host machine, just SCP it. And then on the other end, I'm going to copy it back. OK, great. So I just copied it back. OK, so this is it. Can I unzip it? And this is just would simulate what I would do to give my colleague this stuff, right? And I would upload it somewhere, or email it to him. OK, so now when we go into CD package, there's this CD log file that just tells me what commands I need to run inside this package to rerun the thing that the package creator ran. So first, I got to change into the subdirectory, which is where the, all the scripts were. And then I run this command that I'll explain in a second. 
So once I change into here, I see that this subdirectory contains my original Python script and the london.data file. So as a reminder, here's where we are. We're pretty deep in. We're in our real home directory, inside the package, inside a fake root, and in this um, science demo directory. So as a reminder, let's go back to our original Ubuntu machine, and we're here, right? We're just simply in home Philip Glow Python science demo, okay? And as a reminder here, we can just run Python and do the plot. So I just want to have this pulled up. Okay, now back on our Nopic machine. You know, why can't we do this? Again, these are just Python files, right? Remember, this is why we can't do it, right? Because this running Python runs the Python on the machine itself, which obviously doesn't have the dependencies required. So what else can we do? There's this python.cde file that's also in this directory that CDE created. And all this is is just a shell script. It's just a wrapper. And it um, just executes CDE exec with the original Python command. So the reason why there's all this funny stuff up here is because CDE exec actually resides at the top level of our package. So you got to kind of do this awkward thing to get to CDE exec. But that's why we wrap it in this wrapper so it's easy to invoke. So remember, this is as the slides advertise. You run CDE exec with exact Pyth command, which is Python, and then take your arguments. So if we do this, what happens? So this, you know, this wrapper is made, meant to look like regular Python. Right? So this is the exact same command, except we're going to run it with CDE exec. Here we go, so it pops up. So this is the exact same run before. So this is how my colleague can run my Python experiment on his machine without having to install anything. All right, I mean, this is a fully interactive app here. Um, sometimes different, different distros have different X servers and they have different kind of uh, warnings and stuff. So, so warnings usually sometimes pop up when there are uh, complex graphical apps, but the functionality um, works all the time. So as a reminder, this is not just that. This is running the real Python in the package, right? So if I type Python, I'm running a Python from 2006, and there's no NumPy. If I run Python.cde, in contrast, I'm running the Python from 2010. I'm running the one from the from the original machine, right? This is real Python. This is not just a just not a replay of a trace. I mean, this is this is real Python right here, right? So. Um, so what we can do here is that we can, um, not only can we just run this, I mean, it's great to be able to rerun it, but more importantly, if you know my colleague wants my code, they want to actually modify it, right? They want to actually mess with the code and add some more components and do different analysis and modify it. So one thing they can modify, a simple thing, is they can change the y-axis, right? So this y-axis goes between negative 0.5 and 1.5. If they want to zoom in to between, let's say, 0 and 1, let's say they just change the code. Ah, I like the eye. All right, ready? They change the code, and now the code's been changed, and they can just rerun it. I mean, this is just running real Python. This is not some canned trace or anything, right? So notice how this y-axis here is between 0 and 1. And on our original Ubuntu, the y-axis is between negative 0.5, 1.5. So yes, question? Great. That's a great question. That's the question I was waiting for somebody to ask. Um, so the question is, you know, what this is a dynamic tracking tool, right? So this can only be as good as the paths you're executing. So I mean, this is in the in the testing world, this is your test suite coverage, right? It's like, you know, if you don't execute the paths, CD is not going to grab the required files. So how do we deal with this incompleteness problem? Um, the 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 short answer is that. Usually, you actually are pretty robust uh, because the thing we care about is the files you're loading. So when you, when your colleague actually modifies a script, as long as he doesn't cause a script to, like you say, import any more libraries. If he says import some crazy thing, obviously that crazy thing was in the package. Um, but if he can actually make deltas and tweak your script, like tweaking the parameters, tweaking the algorithm, and so on, it should still work. Um, the I have a slide later on that will they'll kind of explain this. I can, I'll be happy to talk with you about this a little afterwards. But this is, you know, it's inherently an undecidable problem, right? So, like, no automatic tool can grab every single dependency possible. But actually, um, the dynamic approach actually works pretty well in practice because the, the, the intuition is that most programs load most things at startup. And then later on, some paths, you might load other files. But as long as, you know, you're in the same kind of neighborhood, you're pretty safe. But that's a great question. I mean, there is no automatic complete way to do this. Okay, so I'm going to uh, finish up this demo and give the other one. 
So, all right, so here we're done with this, and then I'm going to just uh, clear out of this. So, yeah, so in short, in the Python example, your colleague can modify your experiment. So he can't run a whole new experiment. He can modify your experiment, which is the whole point of you hacked it in the first place. Okay, so I'm just going to remove all this Python stuff just to clear things out. Okay. So the example I just showed is the scenario where um, I'm a developer, I'm a scientist who is writing code and wants to distribute it to other people in a portable way. And CD allows me to do that, right? It allows me to, allows my users to run stuff without installing anything. But CD is also useful when you're not even the developer, when you're just an end user yourself. If I'm just an end user myself, I can still use CD to package up applications that were never meant to be that portable. So uh, as an example, I'm going to use Google Earth. So Google Earth for Linux, actually on their website, they advertise that it works on any kind of Linux 2.6 kind of distribution. I mean, the installer is a one-click thing that works fine. It takes a while to install, but this is the installer I just grabbed from the internet. And you know, it installs in my home directory, it says, great, this is like the process you use to install any software, right? Everything looks good, perfect. Okay, so I think I can run the software now because I've installed it, right? I mean, everything went well. So it actually installed in here. So the executable is here, right here. So what happens when I try to run this? All right, so basically the problem is that the, libs, the most fundamental libraries in this machine, glibc and the C++ standard library, are just too old for the libraries that uh, Google Earth needs. And this is this was not documented anywhere. I mean, advertise is supposed to work, right? But of course, on this machine, because the library is so old, it doesn't work. And there's no way to get Google Earth to run on this machine. I mean, no matter how many times I try, there's no way for this thing to run until I upgrade those libraries. And if I have to upgrade the fundamental C libraries and C++ library machine, it's basically like I'm upgrading the distribution. It's I might as well just have a new distribution. So you know, why can't you upgrade a distribution? You know, one is this is your enterprise machine. If this is your production servers, you can't just upgrade the machine, right? I mean, you got all this other stuff running. Upgrading the machine will probably break other stuff. So it's unacceptable to upgrade the machine. Or you just might have a computer that just has a bunch of stuff working. You don't want to you don't want to upgrade the machine just to run Google Earth, right? For example, because you have all your favorite files and programs on there. Okay, so what we can do though is. I installed Google Earth on here also. So Google Earth does run on my Ubuntu machine because it's like three years newer. So it runs, it starts up. Okay. So what I can do with CDE is the following. I can just run Google Earth prepended with CDE. And it will create a self-contained portable version of Google Earth so that I can run it on my other computer. So I'll start up. Okay, so let's like visit some places. So um, again, this is going back to your question of, you know, how much behavior do you have to exercise in the program before you get a good package? And this really depends. Um, it's really an empirical thing. So I, I'm just going to exercise some typical functionality. Like I'm going to like visit New York, for example, and then I'm going to like visit Mountain View. There's not really a good indicator of how much visiting you have to do. I mean, obviously, you don't have to visit every place in the world to get a good package because most of the time, all the libraries are loaded up front, and maybe by visiting, you know, maybe by just zooming in, I get like one additional library or something. But there's not a really good way to quantify that. So basically, it's just you know, you you try it and test it, and and you see how complete the package is. The, the one recourse you have actually for adding new files in the package is one, you can run it more times, right? You can test some extra functionality, and two, the packages are simply files. Right, so we're in Mountain View here. The packages are simply directories of files, so you can actually go inside and just stuff more files in there yourself. So uh, this enthralling thing will just tar it up. So um, especially if you're the developer, if you're not the developer, you really don't know, you know where all this stuff is. So notice how it's tarring up all these Google Earth libraries. I don't even know where Google Earth installed stuff or what else the installer did. I mean, the installer might have put stuff anywhere. I have no idea. I'm not a developer. It also copies the standard system C libraries which are really necessary because on that Notfix machine, those libraries didn't have the, the, the compatible versions. So let's gzip this. And then we will copy it, again, to the host Mac, and then I'm going to copy it from the Mac back to the other distro. Arch. Okay, copying back. 
All right, so reminder again, this does not work, right? So I'm just going to remove this just to prevent any confusion. So let's uh, extract the package. So this is a school or a package. And now I'm going to, in the log file, it shows me what I need to do, right? It's, it's pretty easy. I just go into the directory, my home directory, where I actually invoke Google Earth first. And this Google Earth, ah, this Google Earth.cde is simply a wrapper. It just finds the CD exec and executes the exact same command, Google Earth, Google Earth. And there we go. And now there's no reason for me to visit the same places, right? So let's try to do San Francisco and see what happens. So this is pretty much running at native speed. It's hard to tell because everything is slow in these VMs because I don't have a, this is a really old laptop. But pretty much you can go anywhere in the world now. I mean, I just visited, you know, I just visited two places just to test out the waters. I might have only needed to visit one place just to test like the zooming functionality. But um, this goes everywhere. And um, I can even activate the 3D buildings view. It takes forever because the VM is slow. But I mean, this is a full on Google Earth right here, right? And so in summary, what I was able to accomplish this demo is that I was, I'm just a user of Google Earth. I can run it on my own computer. I package it up with CD, one command, switch it over, and I'm able to run this you know, huge monolithic 3D application on an operating system that is where it is impossible to run the program, right? I mean, it, it would be impossible for me to run this program without CD. So, yep, okay, cool. Okay, so any questions about the demo? Yes? Okay, let's talk about it. Great. This is not a planned question. This transition to the next uh, phase of the slide. So it was released a few months ago. We have thousand downloads, emails from users, so on. Okay, so what are real-world use cases? These all come from users, okay? These all come from users. Number one, actually distributing self-contained portable software packages. Licensing isn't much of an issue if everything is um, everything is with a reasonable open source license, right? So. That, that is true. That is true. Um, um, if you actually want to make it fully public, if you want to be fully GPL compliant, you have to do that. Um, it's up to the, it's up to the, you know, people have done it. So, you know, I, I hope I don't get in trouble. They, they'll get in trouble maybe. Don't report me, report them. <laughs> Mm. Right. Mm. There are, yeah, my hands are washed clean of this. So I'm just going to report what other people did. I didn't do any of this. Okay. First thing, distributing packages, right? So if you're distributing software, usually what happens is you have these requirements, right? Download this, download this, download this, compile this. It's impossible. No one can do it. Number two, allow users to run live demos of prototypes. So this is an internal thing. So this is not as bad in terms of license, it's just, you know, you're, you're distributing internally within your organization. So this could be proprietary code you've written. You're not letting anyone outside your company see it. So prototyping is very important because when people want to try out different things and experiments, you really need to have a good way of distributing it. And if you're hacking a prototype, you're not going to go through all the packaging thing um, in order just for a few colleagues to run it. So next use case is deploying your computations to a cluster. Again, uh, for um, if it's a cluster your university owns and stuff, it's fine. You're not making it public. Um, this is important because if you have some computation you're running on your machine, like you have some scientific experiment, you just want to, it's embarrassingly parallel, you want to just farm out hundreds of jobs, you can just farm out CD packages to your cluster without installing anything on the cluster. Usually on clusters, you don't have root permissions. So you can't even install anything. That's what other people have used it for. Another thing is reproducing scientific experiments. So that's the Python demo I gave. So you're a colleague, you're running some experiments, you're reproducing it. So you're not making it public, you're just having your colleagues run it. There's like, I like your paper, can I run your experiments? It's a use case. Next one is running production software without perturbing the OS. So this is like on enterprise, on certain kinds of production servers, people have actually used this to try out new utilities and to kind of play around with them without making the dedication of installing because they don't want to bring down their live machine. So there's, this is the people don't want to risk installing stuff. And the last one is running production software in non-native environments. So this is the Google Earth demo. It's like sometimes you just want to run software on another machine that, you know, you have some old machine somewhere that you just don't want to 
um, go through all the burden of, of updating. So this is the Google Earth example. Um, here's some just quick things from people. So this is some diary app that someone made. Um, it's, it, there's some you know personal diary. Um, somebody wanted email me and they wanted to have a portable version that can run on a USB stick um, because they wanted to just bring the diary with them to all the computers. Uh, he emailed the developer. The developer says, said, if you want to run the application itself in the USB key, it's going to be even harder. Probably the best solution would be to compile Amina yourself, statically linking all libraries it depends on into the binary. I've never tried using Amina from a USB key before, but I don't think it'll be easy. So what the developer proposes is doing static linking, which is really a pain because you have to get the static versions of all the libraries, and it's a big pain, and it's really hard. And even the developer says, I don't even want to try it. So what do we do? We ran CD Amina. That's it. I got Amina working on my machine because for some because I don't need a portable, right? I just install it on my machine, ran it, create a package. And I showed it to the guy who developed it. He's like, oh, this is cool. I'll just, you know, I'll put it online. And uh, you know, this is kind of a beta mode. I didn't really test it very robustly. But at least it lets you just download it from a USB, you know, move it on your USB stick. All your files are self-contained in that folder. So, like, your secret diary entries are all in that USB folder. And it's just a convenient way of running it. Um, some other examples is graph tool, this graph, uh, Python graph manipulation library. I mean, look at all these dependencies here. Like, there's no way I can even compile all these. I mean, sometimes, you know, these dependencies all have their own and something will go wrong. So instead, you know, the, the developer actually created packages um, for trying it out. Again, this is the model of, I don't want to, I'm not claiming the CD can replace permanent package management or real installers. This is a good way of demoing and trying stuff. Um, another example, this Arachne, this web application security tool is another security research tool. Um, Requirements, the person uh, put up a CD, the emphasis is mine, escape the dependency hell, right? This is his words, that, you know, uh, you can download the packages, escape dependency hell, or you can download all these things, app get all these things. You know, you know something's going to go wrong when you try to app get one of these things. And his users actually have complained about, I just can't install your, your tool because there's just so many dependencies. And he wrote me this thank you email saying, without CD, I would have to manually duplicate CD's process and package up everything by hand or disappoint most of my users. My guess is that it would take me half the time of the development process to create a self-contained package by hand, which would be an unacceptable and truly scary scenario. And I, I looked in his bug database. His bug database consists of dozens of people complaining that they can't even install his thing. And now one click installs it. Uh, last kind of fun example, this is one I made myself, is a Google Chrome. So similarly to Google Earth, Google Chrome cannot run on older machines. I and mean, this actually is not even supported. Um, so I, I ran Google Chrome on a 2010 Ubuntu machine, a modern machine, and I backported it to that 2006 Nautilus machine. Same one I saw. You can see it at like, tabs open. So that's it. This is the tool, and here is the website. So I'd be happy to take questions um, at this time. Uh, what do you do with environment? Uh, environment variables? Yeah, the environment Yeah, so environment variables, so by default, I copy all the environment variables over. But with um, the other gentleman's question, um, I have an ignore list also. So there are some environment variables I actually ignore. Again, this is pre, so like X authority, some display X windows type stuff. So again, it's um, by default, I copy everything. And it's just a trial and error process, you know, getting all these users, seeing what their complaints are, and just slowly adding to this kind of magic list of things. And it turns out that, you know, after all hundreds of use cases and stuff, I have quite a small list. I can actually show you offline. Quite a small list, maybe a dozen things. A dozen, you know, slash proc, slash sys, certain environment variables. About a dozen covers covers everything. Great. Thanks for the question. Oh.